One river, three brothers, 250 years. EC250 Inc. proudly presents the Sester Centennial Commemorative Celebration of Ellicott City, Maryland. I just introduced myself to you in Miami Ata Wenge, the Miami language. And I just said, hello, it's good to see all of you here today. My name is Diane Hunter, and I am a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and a descendant of Sekakweta and Palanzwa, who are also known as the Godfroys in English. And I am honored to serve my nation as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Now I've been asked to come and talk about Michigan Aqua, a Miami man, a Miami leader, and his relationship with the Ellicotts. But to do that, I have to talk about what came before and what has come since. So I find it's generally good to begin at the beginning. Metame miamiake nipangonje sakachewe chike. At first, the Miami came out of the water. Now that's the first line of our oldest story. It's the story of our emergence as a unique and different people who came to be called Miamiake, Miami people. Now, I want to give you a little geographic orientation. I don't know how familiar you are with the Midwest. Some people around here are very familiar and others not so much. So we'll start with a familiar map, hopefully. So we've got Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Lake Michigan. That's a key marker for us, Lake Michigan. Okay, so that's what it looks like today. But this is what it looks like to Miamiake, to Miami people. This is Miamionge, the land of the Miami. And you can see, let's get my pointer here. You can see there's Lake Michigan. So this is basically the same area that you just saw. So I hope that, that gives you a little bit of orientation to what we're talking about. Now the place that we came out of the water, we called Sakiweyonge, and it was approximately here, that blue dot. And we have lived in Miamionge, the land of the Miami, since time immemorial for longer than anyone can remember. And we lived at Sakiweyongi for a period of time, and then after a while, people began to leave. And one of the early groups that left went to a place where there's a confluence of three rivers. We always liked to live along rivers. Confluences were better. And three rivers, wow, that's great. So we went to Kikayongi, as it came to be called. Today, that is Fort Wayne, Indiana. A lot of people also left and went along the Wapashikisipiwe, the Wabash River, which flows into the Ohio River, if that helps orient you a little bit. Now, it was in the mid-1600s when the French appeared, and we started trading with them. And then in the mid-1700s, we also were trading with the British. Now, it was around that time, sometime between 1747 and 1752, we don't have an exact date, but sometime in that period, a Miami child was born who came to be a very important 
and controversial leader among Miyamiaki. His name was Michikanakwa. In English, Little Turtle. Now, I don't know exactly why he's called Little Turtle. Michikanakwa it refers to the painted terrapin turtle. The phrase Misha usually means big. So it's not his name or it, what it refers to that he was called Little Turtle. But there was another man, an older man, named Turtle in our communities. And so we think that the Americans, seeing two turtles, had to distinguish the older turtle from the younger one, and the young one became Little Turtle, and was called Little Turtle ever since. And there he is. I want to tell you about this photograph and another photograph that you'll see in a moment. This was uh, a drawing done by a Miami woman named Julie Olds, and she wanted me to assure you that these drawings were based on historic interpretations of Michikanakwa. We don't know exactly what he looked like. The only portrait done of him was burned. Um, and it, at the same time that, that I think it was Dolly Madison saved George Washington's portrait, she didn't save Little Turtles. Um, but based on other examples we have. And what I will say is, she does her drawings, he looks Miami. So if it's not what he looks like, it's look, it looks like what he very well may have looked like, or people around him may have looked like. Now in 1763, Michikanakwa is still young, and he is growing up, but there is a treaty among the Americans and the British and the French, primarily British and French, Treaty of Paris, 1763. And in that treaty, the French ceded their claims in North America, in Miamiange, to the British. Now, it was still Miamiange. It was still ours but they ceded it anyway to the British. Now, as Michikanakwa came of age, he became very adept at military pursuits, and he became a war chief leading Miami people in a number of battles, battles at that point against other tribes or men from other tribes. So we had 1783, there was another treaty. And that treaty, the British ceded the land to the Americans. And that began a period of war. Now there was one battle in the war that preceded the end of the American Revolution. And that was in 1780. Now, 250 years we're celebrating here in Ellicott City, right? So this was just a few years after the founding of this place. In 1780, a man named Augustin de la Baume. He was a French military officer. He may or may not have been sent by the Continental Congress. It wasn't clear at the time, it's still not clear. But he came to Kikayonga and attacked. He attacked our villages at Kikayonga and around. But Miami men, led by Michigan Aqua, attacked De La Bombe. In the end, half of De La Baume's men were killed, including De La Baume himself. Well, now, Michikanakwa is really 
seen as an important war chief. Now he has not only defeated war parties from other tribes, he has defeated an American attack on our villages. And so he's gaining great attention. And then it's shortly after that, when we have that Treaty of Paris, 1783, the British cede that land to the Americans. And the Americans believe it is their land. It was not the French to, to give the British. It wasn't the British to give the Americans. But the Americans believe it is their land. And they start coming onto our land. And they are just flooding onto our land illegally. They don't belong there. It is not their land. So that leads to skirmishes. And the skirmishes lead to war. Now the first real battle in this war was in 1790. Now this is a, a drawing, a map that was done of our villages around that time. General Josiah Harmar came with troops. They started at Fort Washington, which is today Cincinnati, Ohio. And they came north to attack Kikayonga. Now, we heard that they were coming before they got there. They were about 35 miles out when we got wind that they were coming. So we prepared for them. And we set a trap for them. It was planned and executed by Michikanakwa, possibly also some Shawnee and Delaware chiefs as well. As you can see on this map, there are Shawnee and Delaware villages also in this metropolitan area as it has become of Kikayonga. Well, in the end, Harmar and his men retreat back to Fort Washington with heavy losses. But before they go, they burn our villages, they burn our cornfields, they destroy our food stores. It was a very difficult winter for us. People were starving because we had no food. Well, the next year, President Washington appoints General Arthur St. Clair, who was the territorial governor of the Northwest Territory, and he appointed him to command troops to do what Harmar had failed to do. So they began at Fort Washington again, and they're making their way to Kikayonga. Now, they think they're pretty close to Kikayonga. They're not. They are quite some distance away, but they think they're close. And so they encamp for the night. Now, we have been watching them. We've been following them. And so there's an alliance of about nine different tribes that, based on where St. Clair and his men are encamped, we come up with a plan. And the plan is made by Michikanakwa, the Shawnee chief Blue Jacket, and the Delaware chief Bukongahilas. Their plan is to surround the encampment. So they had people in this crescent shape. Some were straight on, some were on each side. But as they attacked, they surrounded St. Clair's encampment. It was not a long battle. And very soon, St. Clair and his men who were left, not very many were left, but they headed out of town. It wasn't town, but they headed out as quickly as they could. To this day, St. Clair's defeat, as this battle is called, is still known as the greatest defeat of the US Army ever in terms of the percentage of the army that was killed during the war, during the battle. 
there were very few men left in the U.S. Army after that battle. Now, the victory was very likely due to the exceptional military skills of Michigan Aqua, Blue Jacket, and Bukonga Helis. It was also due to the fumbling and bumbling of the Americans. They didn't know where they were. They didn't have their supply lines working properly. And they hadn't trained their men, so they just didn't know what they were doing. You know, after this battle, Michikanaqua and Blue Jacket refused to speak to each other. It was such a great victory. And they each wanted to claim that they were the major leader. They were the leader of all of the people who had attacked. And they would never give the other credit. Well, President Washington was angry. He was very, very angry at St. Clair. And there were numerous repercussions from that failure at that battle. But Washington then appointed General Anthony Wayne to try again. Well, Wayne had to recruit troops. He had no army left. So he recruited troops, and he trained them, and he trained them. It took him three years to do that. But in 1794, they headed again from Fort Washington, heading to Kikayonga. But we met them in battle at a place called Fallen Timbers. Now, Fallen Timbers is on the Maumee River in northern Ohio. This battle didn't go so well for us. Now, there were not very many casualties on either side. It was about the same number of casualties on both sides. But we retreated, and Wayne's army claimed victory. Probably the most devastating part of that battle was that like those before him, after the battle, Wayne and his men went along the Maumee River, destroying every village, every cornfield, every food store that they could find, all the way to Kikayonga. And once again, we were starving that winter. And that, probably more than anything, is why we were willing to go to peace treaty. It wasn't that we had lost the battle. It was that we couldn't sustain losing our homes and our food year after year. We had, we had to have peace. This war, we could not survive any longer. And so we went to the Treaty of Greenville in 1795 with a number of other tribes who had been fighting in these battles. Michiganaqua and a chief named Legree, who is also from Kikayonge, led the Miami delegation to this treaty. And Michiganaqua was the lead speaker for the Miami. And our focus was on peace. We want peace. Now, Michiganaqua did something unique. To my knowledge, no tribe or leader of a tribe had done this before. He actually outlined the boundaries of Miamionge, which, of course, we, there were never really boundaries. We just moved in and out of areas as we needed to. But for this purpose, he drew the boundaries. And he said, starting from Detroit, going south along the Scioto River. Now, the Scioto River divides Ohio pretty much in half. So you go from Detroit down the Scioto River to the Ohio go west on the Ohio to where the, it's the confluence of the Wabash, and then north to Chicago. So you can see the shaded portion is what he outlined as Miami Onge. Now today, for a variety of reasons, we claim 
much greater area as having been our land. But that's what he claimed for the purposes of the treaty negotiation. Nishikanaka spoke really strongly for Miami people. Most of the other tribal leaders, in fact, all of the other tribal leaders were very conciliatory. Whatever Wayne wanted, because General Wayne was the negotiator for the Americans, whatever he wanted, they, they agreed to. Michigan Aqua was the only one willing to stand up to him. Maybe it's because he had so quickly changed from a war chief to a peace chief. Normally it takes years for a war chief to develop into a peace chief. But he made that transition almost instantaneously. And so I think some of the things that he had learned, that boldness, that determination that he had as a war chief, he's now applying it in the negotiations with General Wayne. So Wayne said, uh, well, the French gave this land to the British, and the British gave it to us. The Michigan Aqua said, the French never told us they wanted to purchase our land. Just saying, it's still ours. So he really was an amazing spokesperson and diplomat for Miami Aki, for Miami people. But when everybody else had signed the treaty, he agreed to sign so that he could have peace. And in that treaty, the tribe ceded most of what is Ohio today, and then portions of Indiana and, and some other places where the Americans had forts. But it was primarily Ohio that we ceded. Now, after the treaty was over and everyone else went home, Michigan Aqua stayed a couple of extra days. He had along with him his son-in-law, Epicaneta, also known as William Wells. Now, Wells had been his interpreter, because Michigan Aqua did not speak or, or understand English. So Wells was his interpreter, and I believe the, the interpreter for a number of the tribal leaders, um, because he seemed to speak a number of languages. But he was the interpreter throughout those negotiations. And Michigan Aqua went to Wayne and he said, I would like for my son-in-law here, William Wells, to be the Indian agent. The, in other words, the representative of the US government to Miami people. Now, you can say every father-in-law wants to give his son-in-law a leg up, help him get along. But what did that do for Michigan Aqua? It gives him an in with the United States government. Now, every, tri every tribe had multiple villages, and each village had its own chief. That meant the Americans had to deal with lots and lots of chiefs from every tribe, and they didn't like that. So they would have what they called American Alliance chiefs or peace medal chiefs. And those chiefs were the ones they, they preferred to deal with, one chief per tribe. Well, that put Michigan Aqua in the position to be that alliance chief. And as alliance chief, he was able to make a number of visits to federal officials. And when he first came east, he was amazed and concerned about what he saw. He noted that it was only a short time since the whites first set foot among us, yet already they swarm like flies. While we who have been here, nobody knows how long, are still as thin as deer. He's beginning to see why the Americans had more men. We completely decimated their army, and three years later, they come back with a full army. Now he understands, because there are so 
many people that there are always more men to fight. He noted, when I walk the streets, I see everybody busy about something. One makes shoes, another hats, a third cloth, and all live by their work. I say to myself, which of these things can I do? Not one. I can make a bow, catch fish, kill deer, and go to war. But none of these things are done here. Now, I do wonder what he didn't say, but I, I wonder if he was thinking, I can't do any of those things, but my wife can do all of them. Because Miamia women made everything that we used. That was not the men's role. So Little Turtle would not have learned to make things. And then he says, they spread like oil upon a blanket. We dissolve like snow before the vernal sun. If we do not change our course, it is impossible for the race of wet red men to subsist. And I think this is the thinking that led him to be very receptive to adopting American ways. He saw that as the only way for us to survive. Now, during these trips, he visited Baltimore in 1801 and Ellicott's Mills in 1807. Now, apparently he made a pretty impressive figure. He is described as exceeding all his brother chiefs in dignity of appearance, a dignity which resulted from the character of his mind. He was of medium stature, with a complexion of the palest copper shade. He did not wear paint. His hair was a full suit and without any admixture of gray. His dress was completed by a long red military sash around the waist, and his hat, a chapeau bras, was ornamented with a red feather. In other places noted that he dressed like an American, except he wore leggings, moccasins, and large gold earrings. So you can see the earring style that he might have been wearing. So let's take a look at, at this history of the, of the connections between Ellick Mills and Miami people. So in 1799, there's a letter. It was from the Committee on Indian Concerns in Philadelphia to the Baltimore Committee. And they said that the Miami nation had made a request to the committee for some friends to settle among them. And as a result, they furnished them with two plows, a harrow, gears, and some other things. Now, in December of 1801, in Baltimore, the Indian Committee of Baltimore and Ellicott's Mills met a group of chiefs who were on their way to Washington to meet with the president. And naturally, Michiganaqua was among them, and Wells was with him as in his interpreter. Now, the committee's agenda for the meeting was the introduction of, into their tribes of some of the arts of civilized life. Now, I believe that they specifically meant American farming. And I've since, I was last here come to learn that Ellicott had his own way of farming that he had shared with all his neighbors. So I suspect that it specifically meant farming the Ellicott way. They also wanted to remonstrate against the use of spirituous liquors. 
And Michigan Aqua was very much in tune with that. He had great concerns about the use of alcohol among Miami people. So he, he had no, no argument with that at all. So they went on to Washington and met with President Jefferson in January of 1802 at the President's Mansion in Washington. And Michigan Aqua outlined some of our concerns to Jefferson. He asked that Jefferson ensure that the settlers are restricted to their own territory. They were crossing those lines that had been agreed to at, at Greenville. And Michigan Aqua said, you know, our younger men are not going to tolerate that. And I'm afraid they're going to break the peace if, if Americans keep coming over into our land. We can't, he didn't say this word, but basically he's saying, we can't babysit our young men. We can't keep them from, from doing what they want to do. You need to keep Americans on their side of the border. He also asked that when Miami people would sell our land, that it be required that they sell it to the United States and not to individual Americans. He was afraid that American individuals would cheat the Miami people when they, they bought the land. And he trusted the US government not to do that. Unfortunately, he was wrong in that. Um, but that law actually did pass, uh, or at least is it part of treaties, that land belonging to Miami individuals could only be sold with the president's permission. Turned out that wasn't always a good idea in a lot of ways. Now, in Greenville, we didn't just give them our land. They had to pay for it. They had to pay for it with, for each tribe, $1,000 worth of goods. It wasn't money, but goods that they were supposed to, to give us. And not all at once. It was in annuities, some every year. And Michigan Aqua said, you know, what you're sending us is really inferior product. And it gets damaged on the way here. And some of the things that you promised us in the treaty have never gotten to us. We want our stuff, in other words. And he did also ask Jefferson to prohibit anyone from selling alcohol to Native people. And that law was, was passed, not very successfully, but it was passed. Now, in September of 1803, so about a year and a half later, the Baltimore and Ellicott's uh, Ellicott's Mills Committee uh, received a letter from Michigan Aqua and Five Metals. Now, Five Metals was a Potawatomi chief, and he, his land was very close to Little Turtle's Village. And so they were really good friends. And so they wrote this letter together. They thanked them for the farm implements that they had sent, and they said they hoped they could get the men to use them. Now, some have interpreted that to say they didn't know how to use them. I don't think that was the problem. I think they didn't know how to get the men to agree to use the, the implements. He said, we hope the Great Spirit will change the minds of our people and tell them it will be better for them to cultivate the earth than to drink whiskey. So he really saw getting men to farm was a way to basically save Miami men. But we had been farming since long, long before Americans, British, French, anyone. Probably around the year 1000, we started farming. But our women were our farmers, not our men. So getting our men to be farmers meant taking away the value of the work as farmers from the women. 
Well, in response to this letter, they sent George Ellicott and Ger Gerard T. Hopkins to come to visit the Miami and the Potawatomi and to arrange for Philip Dennis to come and teach farming. So in April of 1804, Ellicott and Gerard want to gather all the Miami and Potawatomi people together so they can speak to them. Now, April would be a good time as far as farming is concerned, because if we can convince them to farm, this is perfect time to start, right? Not the perfect time for our Miami habits. Many of our young men were out hunting, and most of our women we're in sugar camp, making maple sugar and, and uh, maple syrup. So there weren't a lot of people around, but they were able to gather a, a, a small group of Miami and Potawatomi people together. Now, Ellicott and Hopkins wrote down the speech in advance so that they were careful what they said. Fortunately, we still have the text of that speech, so we know exactly what he said, at least in English. So he noted that the situation of, as he said, our red brethren was changing, and they need to change their way of living. And, and he says, our red brethren, and I think in this case, brethren is very specifically men. Our red brethren ought to begin to cultivate their lands they ought to raise corn and other grain, also horses, cows, sheep, hogs, and other animals. And then they said, farming is easier than hunting. Now, I don't know how many of you are farmers or hunters, but I don't think today we would say farming is easier than hunting. Farming is work. Hunting is sport for most people. And I'm not sure that our men bought the idea that farming would be easier either. But noted that they had Philip Dennis there to teach them. And then he says, the white people find it necessary that their young men should farm and not their women. Women are less than men. They are not as strong as men. They are not able to endure fatigue as men. Now, you mothers out there, you know that's not true. But that's the way they saw things at the time. And then he says, it is the business of our women to be employed in our houses, to keep them clean, to sew, to knit, spin, and weave, to dress food for themselves and their families, to make clothes for the men and the rest of their families, to keep the clothes of their families clean, and to take care of the children. Now, if I were the translator, because most of the Miami people are not, they don't know English, they don't understand English, it's all being translated for them. If I were translating that, I would be very careful what I said. But if the, the interpreter said exactly what was said here, what do you think Miami women are thinking? I imagine they're thinking, we do all of that already, and we farm. Now, Ellicott and uh, Hopkins later note that the Indians observed with great gravity and decorum during the time of our addressing them and seemed to reiterate the sentiments delivered by repeated shouts. Wouldn't you like to know what they were actually <laughs> shouting? Well, following their speech, Michigan Aqua gives his speech. Now, remember, Ellicott's speech is being translated into Miami Atawenge, but Michiganaqua is speaking to his people in their language, and his speech is being translated for the Americans, okay? So he has to be very careful what he says. 
So he says, all the words which you have said today were certainly calculated for our good. You have told us that if we adopt the plan you have proposed, we should want for nothing. We hope we shall finally be able to convince our young men that this is the plan we ought to adopt to get our living. You have also been very particular in pointing out to us the duties of our women. Tell your old chiefs that it is a work which cannot be done immediately, that we are that way disposed, and we hope it will take place gradually. In other words, I still have to convince them to do this. Now, Five Metals and Michiganaqua agreed that Philip Dennis's instructional farm would not be near either of their villages. They said because they don't want the people of either village to be jealous of the other one for getting the farm there. They put it a little ways from either village and I think probably so it didn't upset anybody. So Philip Dennis sets up his farm and he says, you know, only one or two of, of the men came with any disposition to labor. Most of them would come and they'd sit on, on the fence or they'd sit up in the tree without any apparent interest in plowing or hoeing and not offering to lend a hand. He was just flabbergasted at that. He just couldn't quite understand that. My take, they're sitting up in the trees laughing at him for doing women's work. Moving ahead, it's Christmas week, 1807. Michiganaqua, Miami Principal Chief Pinjewa, Jean-Baptiste Richardville, and leaders from other Great Lakes tribes have been to Washington, D.C., and they're on their way home. And while they're there, they stop at Ellicott Mills and they share a meal at George, George Ellicott's home. Now, in the meantime that all of this is happening, we're signing more treaties and giving up more and more land. There's a treaty in 1805 and we cede the southern portion of what is today Indiana. And we cede more land in 1809. And these treaty negotiations really highlight how other Miami leaders are coming to oppose Michiganaqua. They don't like that he have been, has been positioning himself as a leader through the United States government and not from the Miami people. They don't like that because William Wells is the Indian agent, all of the annuities are going to Little Turtle's village and not to the other villages. They don't like that Michiganaqua is trying to force Miami people to change. It's not the Miami way for the leaders to tell us what to do. Change. Anything that happens in Miami people has to be grassroots. It has to come from the people. And then it's the leader's job to do the will of the people, to make sure that what they want happens. And that's not the way he was doing it. He's trying to tell them what to do. And we don't like that. And that's the difference between a war leader and a, and a civil leader. A war leader has to command. Among Miami people, a civil leader may not command. And I'm sure that the women really didn't appreciate him trying to take their farming from them. So in the early 1800s, um, a body that comes to be called the Miami National Council is formed specifically to oppose Michiganaqua. And Pinjewa, Jean-Baptiste Richardville, is chosen as principal chief. And I'm quite sure that that's why he was with Michiganaqua on that 1807 visit, because now he is the principal chief. 
as far as Miami people are concerned, whatever the US government thinks. And we have a letter showing the appointment of Michikanakwa, or excuse me, uh, Pinjewa as principal chief. Now in 1812, just five years later, Michikanakwa is ill. He goes to Fort Wayne, he's by now Fort Wayne, to the home of his son-in-law, William Wells. And in July that year, he died and was buried in the Miami Cemetery. A year, 100 years later, in 1912, his grave and many other graves were found when they were building houses over that cemetery. And they were able to identify his grave because of the grave goods, the things that had been buried with him. Now around this time, about 100 years after his death, his granddaughter, Kilsaqua, recalled sitting on her grandfather's lap when she was just a small child. And I have to wonder, was she aware of the desecration of her grandfather's grave at that time? She was alive. She lived, today it wouldn't be far from Fort Wayne, but at the time it would have been quite a distance. But I just wonder, did she know what was happening? Now in 1959, the house over Michikanakwa's grave was torn down and that area was made a small public park. And you can go there to visit Michiganakwa's grave today. The War of 1812 came to Miami in December of 1812. And among the other travesties, Michiganakwa's village was burned to the ground by US troops. This is the home of a man that they had honored and only months after his death, they burned his village. Well, we continued to have more treaties after the War of 1812 was over. And so there was a treaty in 1818. And a large chunk of what is today Indiana was ceded. And then there was a treaty in 1826 and 1834 and 1838 and in 1840. In that treaty in 1840, we ceded the last of our communal tribal land. But more importantly, we agreed to go west. We agreed to be removed to land west of the Mississippi and to leave our ancestral homelands. But no one wanted to go. And we kept putting it off and putting it off. And then in September of 1846, US soldiers came to our villages and they rounded us up and took us to a prison camp near what is today Peru, Indiana. Now well, there were some people who said, we are not going west. And when they heard that the soldiers had come, they fled north. And among those people was the Pigeon family who lived in Turtle Town. So they took us to Peru, to the prison camp, and on October 6, 1846, they boarded us on to canal boats. Just to remind you, today is October 8. So 176 years ago, right now, my people were on canal boats. We were taken on the canals east into Ohio and south to Cincinnati where the canals ended. And from there we were boarded on steamboats. We took steamboats on the Ohio, the Mississippi, and the Missouri rivers to what is today Kansas City. And then we went overland by horse and wagon 50 miles south to the new Miami reservation.
Seven people died during the journey. Six of them were children. The seventh was an elder man. But it was a hard winter. And by the end of that year, a total of at least 30 people had died, about 10% of those who went on removal. It was a hard winter. But then we began building houses and schools and businesses. We started creating a better life for our children. And then the Americans came again. And things got difficult. After the Civil War, the US government wanted us to remove a second time, this time south to Indian Territory, what is today Oklahoma. Things had gotten so bad in Kansas that we agreed to go. And so our tribal government went south to northeastern Oklahoma on the Neosho River. We're still living on rivers. In 1936, they passed the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. And under that act, we wrote our Constitution. And we became specifically the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. So the tribe went west. A few families were allowed to stay in Indiana. And under an amendment to our Constitution in 1996, now all Miami people, whether we live in Oklahoma or Kansas or Indiana or anywhere else, we are able to enroll as citizens of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. But the result of that removal is that we are a divided people. We have citizens in all 50 states. I didn't ask, but I will assure you that at least one Miami person lives in Maryland, and probably more than that. But when we're divided, and a small family or small group of families lives separately from everybody else, and they're surrounded by people of a different culture, it's very easy to adopt that culture that you're living in. And then there's loss of your own culture. And for us, that also meant language loss. Our last fluent speakers of our language died in the 1960s. But today, we are in a period of revitalization. The town of Miami, Oklahoma, is our seat of government. And by our constitution, that we are governed by the General Council. And the General Council is every citizen, 18 and older, who comes to our annual meeting and votes. And at that meeting, we elect our elected leaders. These are our current leaders. This gentleman in the center there is Chief Douglas Langford, and he's been our chief for nine years now. But, According to Miami tradition, if he did not do the will of the people, if he and these other leaders do not do what we tell them at that annual meeting, they're not going to get reelected. Because even today, our leaders are servant leaders. We are a sovereign nation. And as a sovereign nation, we have services for our people. We have our own police force, we have our own court, we have a preschool, and we have services for our elders. Miami Nation Enterprises is our economic arm of our tribe. And through MNE, we own a number of different businesses in whole or in part that supports our government, pays for our government, and also pays for our cultural revitalization. So as part of that cultural revitalization, we have lots of activities, um, particularly gatherings together. So we have our annual meeting where we come in June to vote and do a lot of other things together as Miami people. 
And we also have a gathering in uh, January, a winter gathering, and other gatherings at various times as well. But definitely those two, even during COVID, we held them. We, our business meeting was short and quick, and we all left town as soon as we could. And our, our winter gathering was by Zoom, but we still had those gatherings because we can't let that go again. When we get together in person, we dance. The stomp dance is a traditional dance. that It was one of those things that was lost to us. But we originally learned it from the Shawnee, so they taught it to us again. And we do this. We can do it any time of year. It's pretty cold out there for them to be dancing. You dance around a fire. Usually in the winter, we dance indoors around a fake fire. But we love to stomp dance. In the winter, we have a storytelling event. It's in the winter because many of our stories can only be told in the wintertime. You notice these storytellers are all young. That's not right. Those stories should be told by our elders to the younger people. But my generation and the generation before us didn't learn those stories. They weren't taught to us. So now, these young people are learning the stories and they're telling the stories to all of us. And as many of us in this room know, one day those young people will be elders and they will be telling those stories to their children and their grandchildren and things will be ordered properly again. So I said our language went to sleep when our last fluent speakers died in the 1960s. But in the 1990s, we began a language revitalization, and we are starting to learn our language again. We have an online dictionary, an online learning app. We have camps in the summer for our children where they learn our language, where they learn um, various aspects about our culture. And most of all, they learn how they are connected to each other as Miami people. And now, thanks to COVID, we have a lot of online language learning classes as well where we get together and are taught so we don't have to be there. We can, we can be wherever we are and have a language class together. We play games that we have played since time immemorial. When the French first arrived in the 1600s, they wrote down that we were playing these games. Peketaha Minge. Lacrosse, yes, you recognize it. Even though our sticks are quite different than the modern sticks. These are our traditional style sticks. And we have Miami artists. Yes, they are an art to make these sticks. And we play with these traditional style sticks today. Other games that we play, Senza Winge is a dice game, and the Makasina is a hide the pebble game. And we play those games whenever we get together. I said the stories can only be told in the winter, lacrosse can only be played in the summer, probably for obvious reasons, but we do one and then we do the other. But these games we can play any time of year and we do. We just had a big Makasina tournament this summer. My colleague, his team came in second. He said the prize for the, the winners was really good. All he got was a firm high five. <laughs> so we enjoy playing together. Ribbon work is a Miami sewing art. And I shouldn't say it's just Miami because um, many of the Great Lakes tribes and beyond do ribbon work. But Miami ribbon work is rather unique in that our designs are always diamond patterns. The Potawatomi do floral patterns. Other tribes do different kinds of designs. Ours are always diamond patterns. And it's, we take silk, silk ribbons, Today we use taffeta because it's easier to sew with and cheaper. Um, but you cut the ribbons, fold them, and then sew them in layers to form these patterns. 
The piece here is a piece that was done 200 years ago. And I'm going to go back here and point out some of the ways that we use these diamond patterns even today. So we do make t-shirts with the, the diamond patterns imprinted on them. We paint them on our bowls, our game bowls. It's on the blanket. It's on the game mats. I even use them on my PowerPoint slides. When we see these particular kinds of ribbon work designs, when I see that, I know it was done by a Miami person. And if they got a t-shirt with one of those designs on, even if it doesn't say Nilo Miami, I am Miami, I know they are because that's, it's very recognizable. So my work as tribal historic preservation officer is about our identity, who we are as Miami people. It's about our way of life, our unique perspective. And that comes from our language, our culture, our stories, our history. And probably more than anything, my job is about leaving all that is Miami all that is from Miami people behind for the next generations. Mishinewe, thank you for listening. And I am open to any questions that you might have.